Okay, so welcome back, everyone. Now we will move on in our agenda with the panel that will be chaired by Professor Lita Chiesa and Julia, uh, with our panelists from the H4 Consortium that will uh, show some lessons learned from the experience uh, through the project. So I will leave the floor to our colleagues. Thank you, Marco. Welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure for, for us, I will talk also on behalf of Julia, to coordinate this very rich session. So I ask to the colleagues that will present to come here and sit uh, it. My role and the role of Julia is just, uh, yes, please, is just to introduce uh, each presenter and then uh, uh, listen with the attention uh, the contribution. Uh, we will have time for questions at the end of the first round of presentation, so if you have a question, we will have time at the end of the first presentation. I ask uh, to introduce the first uh, presenter. Thank you very much. Uh, for me, it's a, a great pleasure being here introducing our uh, valuable speakers. And the first one is uh, Marit. She's a professor of uh, work and organizational psychology at the Department of uh, Psychology at the uh, Norwegian University of Science and uh, Technology. And uh, she's leading the research group in the NTNU uh, Health Workplace and participating and uh, leading uh, several uh, international projects and consortia. Uh, with uh, Suton, uh, they are uh, leading the PTRE collect. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here and uh, meet all the wonderful colleagues that I learned to know uh, during this uh, project. And thank you uh, to Univo also for um, arranging this wonderful event. I'm going to talk about the needs, and as uh, needs assessment tool HAT and the possibilities and challenges that we see in uh, the instrument that we have uh, developed. Um, the background for this is that we have all the standardized uh, questionnaires for mapping the psychosocial working conditions in organizations uh, that are often used around um, Europe. However, it neither considers individuals' appraisal of the working conditions nor the specific context of the workplace. And the situation for SMEs and public workplaces around Europe is that they actually need uh, tools that they can handle themselves because they don't have the economy to afford consultants uh, and uh, others to help them do this uh, mapping. So the age work needs assessment tool um, is taking a comprehensive um, approach because it includes both the context uh, both health-reducing and motivational factors within the work environment and the IGLO levels. It includes multiple stakeholders' perception of the work environment. And uh, it informs the choice of interventions also at multiple levels of the organization. So the aim is to give an overview of the development and application and utility of this um, HAT tool and show the possibilities and challenges by using the tool. You recognize uh, this uh, slide. It's the theoretical framework used in uh, HVERT project. And uh, we use the same pillars when developing the HAT tool. Um, the focus on multi-level interventions using the IGO model the participatory approach, where we include different stakeholders at different levels of the organization, um, and also the positive occupational health psychology approach, which is more holistic, uh, includes both prevention and promotion, demands and resources. Just a short uh, summing up of what was the HAT, the HVERC Assessment Toolkit. Um, the objective is to inform the development of an action plan and choice of interventions at different levels of the organization. 
and it includes a template for interviews with middle managers and senior managers. It's a, a template for focus group interviews for employees, including a cognitive mapping exercise, a template for mapping the context of the organization, and a template for mapping objective measures and cost-effectiveness. In, uh, in addition to that, it's a template for a stakeholder meeting and a template for an action plan. Um, here you can see uh, <clears throat> when we have conducted these uh, needs uh, interviews um, and context measures, uh, it feeds into a template grid for summarizing the needs. Here you can see the ideal levels and you can see the resources and figures, the models and barriers, policies and practices, needs suggested by employees, needs suggested by uh, middle and senior managers. I would like to uh, show uh, the stakeholder meeting because that's also a new way of discussing this because it brings all the stakeholders together where they are supposed to develop and decide upon an action plan and choice of multi-level interventions. So uh, uh, they are first going to have uh, a cognitive mapping exercise to prioritize um, uh, the needs that came up from the needs analysis and for the stakeholder meeting part two uh, they go from needs to concrete actions. So here uh, the HIT uh, provides a list of possible interventions and it should be um, fitted with the prioritization from the stakeholder meeting part one. So it's important regarding intervention fit and action plan. So uh, this is uh, the model in practice where you see the first part of the stakeholder meeting and the second part of the stakeholder meeting um, and uh, how uh, it can be used in practice by uh, the stakeholders. This uh, is an example of overview of intervention at each intervention site for group one. And here you can see how um, the tool actually uh, informs interventions at different levels of the organization. See that most uh, interventions are on the individual level, but there are also several on the leader level, some on the group le uh, level, and a uh, few on the organizational level. <clears throat> and then, what are the possibilities and what are the challenges of uh, these two? Well, as you see, uh, and the result shows us that it actually identifies needs at the different levels of the organization. Um, and also, it informs the choice of interventions at multiple levels. It includes the stakeholders. It's a kind of an intervention in itself that it brings these people together to discuss what do we want to do with our work environment? What kind of interventions do we fit? So we kind of uh, introduce a dialogue and an understanding of each other's situation. It has a comprehensive approach, not just focusing on the treatment part of mental health, but also focusing on prevention and promotion, uh, working on the work environment, including both positive and negative factors. It also brings in context as a basis for integrating these new interventions into the already existing policies, programs and practices within the organization. Um, but of course there are also some challenges that we need to work on and that's why also the process understanding is so important. Uh, the corona situation has shown us that uh, we have uh, a need for digital solutions that will work in this context and also we have papers showing that we have some positive uh, outcomes of using these, these digital solutions for, for this. Um, it shows also the importance of the work that needs to be done in the, in the anchoring and preparation phase because the knowledge um, the attitude and the awareness of what is really mental health and how can we work with it 
is so important for readiness for change and uh, uh, and actually uh, be able to go through with this kind of, uh, of process. And the last point, and not least, maybe the most important point is how to integrate this in the everyday life of the organization. So it's not just a one-time thing, but this is something that continues a work where you learn on how this can be done, what is good solutions, adjustments along the way to make sustainable organizations in the regard of mental health. very much. So uh, the next presenter, uh, Maggie, she's an assistant professor at the University of Amsterdam and uh, she's a certificate uh, leadership coach, job crafting and mindfulness trainer. Um, her research uh, interests are uh, based on occupational, uh, positive occupational psychology, personal resources, job crafting, self-compassion, mindfulness and intervention. Uh, Vince, uh, he's a PhD candidate at the University of uh, Amsterdam and uh, He's uh, trying to um, integrate uh, behavioral change uh, strategies with uh, work psychology and uh, um, the uh, intervention uh, to promoting uh, mental health in, on, um, within the organization. And uh, Meg and Vince uh, with uh, Roy and uh, Edwin are the lead of uh, the for uh, implementation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. It's uh, wonderful to be here uh, three and a half years later after we started in this very room. And one of the things I personally really appreciate about the Hager project is, as uh, Mara just introduced the HUD tool, the assessment tool, that we really build on these tools. So I'm going to talk to you about the Hager intervention toolkit. And as we will see, it really builds, it's really the next step after um, an organization has gone through this assessment phase. So, tools to intervene and tips for implementation. I'll share a little bit with, about our um, lessons learned, but also what is this H-Work Intervention Toolkit? So, the H-Work Intervention Toolkit, yeah, I feel proud to say that as Work Package 4, it's, it's nearly the beating heart of H-Work, because here we're really going into what can organizations do in terms of interventions? Eh? What, what do employees need to learn? What do they need to change? Um, so how did we go about achieving a, a toolkit? Um, of course, we worked together with the whole consortium, and the aim for this toolkit was to collect uh, interventions, to describe, and also to implement interventions in various organizations across Europe. Another addition to this is a nice uh, picture of the, the I do, the four different, uh, different levels within organizations. So how did we go about this? We did reviews of literature reviews. Of course, there's a lot of knowledge uh, in scientific literature about interventions, and this is an area that is still growing. And we combined this with the expertise of all our wonderful partners in the, in the HR consortium. So in, eventually we ended up with 18 uh, different interventions which are in the HR toolkit, and which are also described on the uh, innovation platform, as Audrey uh, and Lucia talked us through. Um, there are in in intervention information sheets where organizations have access to what does the intervention consist of, where can you find more literature on it, and who can you contact if you want more information. So this is really very important um, because then organizations can find their way in terms of what do we need to do. So what type of interventions were developed? Mara has just showed us a few. Um, basically, there's intervention on each level, but what we've seen is that from the H, uh, uh, assessment needs, uh, sorry, needs analysis in each test site, we found that most uh, interventions were developed on the individual level. And what you see here in the grid is uh, basically a tool to help organizations identify which uh, intervention may be appropriate. Of course, going through the HUD 
a system to find out and to discuss with various stakeholders. But what you see on top is various outcomes. So for example, depression, mental health, job <coughs> satisfaction and engagement. And then in each column you see the various interventions here. So on the individual level, there are things like coaching, strength-based approaches, mindfulness-based approaches, um, different sorts of interventions. On the group level, the level of the team within organizations, or some at, at times also department level, those interventions are mainly focused on how can we help groups or teams to develop the processes of collaborating together in a positive way. And, and that will also, also impact mental health. Also, the interventions were focused on how can we make this a topic that's not stigmatized to talk about? How can we open the discussion? How can we help employees in teams to be more vulnerable about what's happening for them and to be non-judgmental when others open up about their, how they're doing? So various uh, team interventions, team coaching, team crafting, positive social interaction. And again, all of these interventions, they will come out of the heart. And this is something that we consistently stress. And because it's very tempting for organizations just to think, oh yeah, we need uh, strength crafting. However, we always advise people to go through the hut first. The leader level tools, as you see here from the, from the grid, they're mainly focused on creating awareness around mental health, creating awareness around mental health issues that employees may have, and helping leaders to develop their leadership skills to feel confident to deal with those issues. And particularly in our own test site, these, these were project managers, and they did not have a HR responsibility, yet we still invited them to develop their skills to be able to talk about such issues. Finally, organizational tools. There you see two interventions, appreciative feedback survey and optimization of healthy organizational practices. And both interventions were aimed at looking at policies and procedures and coming up with action plans based on what employees reported through survey feedback, for example. So that was a very brief overview of the, the hit. Looking back on our journey, uh, we came up with 10, 10 tips, and I think you're going to get a few tips, and some are repetitive, but I think that's a good thing, because we want to remember them, of course. So when you want to start uh, with such a mental health improvement uh, intervention, very important to include relevant stakeholders in the organization. And so not, not just an HR person, but be broad, always include um, in employees. Participation is a key word here. And then use the hunt to identify the needs of the organization, what is necessary. Don't be over ambitious. It's better to start with small steps and have a positive experience in that. In that. That's also based on self-efficacy theory. Then to try to do everything and then find out that you didn't get anywhere. So starting with small steps is important. In our case, it was also very important that we had a really good project champion who helped us to communicate the project who uh, helped us with recruiting participants and who had a positive uh, impact on our knowledge of the organization and the system and the context that we were operating in, as Mara's stress is very important. So you, of course, link the prioritized needs that come from the needs assessment. Meetings. Um, very important to make a communication plan early on, using channels that are existing in the organization. As like larger organizations, public organizations may have a communication department. Um, and this is really necessary to get through all the layers of such large organizations. In SMEs, it may be smaller, uh, less employees, but it's still very important to find the right channels to help employees understand what is this project about, why, how can I benefit if I take part, etc. So also important to think, what is our implementation plan? And this is a whole science in itself. Um, to su summarize in one sentence, for your implementation, who needs to do what, and when, what intervention activity is taking place, for which target group, uh, at what point in time, uh, for which group, for which exact uh, employees. And also thinking about what expertise do we have in-house in the organization and what expertise may we need to hire uh, if it's not present, uh, in, for example, in smaller um, uh, enterprises. It's important to monitor your process and, and also the progress and communicate this back to employees to keep people engaged, to keep people enthusiastic and make employees see the worth of such projects. 
and use the head then, we're going to hear about that in the minutes from Caroline, to evaluate how did it go, what did you learn, and hopefully to continue uh, a, a learning cycle, a positive spiral, learning about mental health and improving. And the tenth tip is also about the process and our own work engagement as practitioners, scientists, practitioners, to celebrate success and see this uh, health at work as a step-by-step -step learning journey. And I say health at work, and I want to end with uh, something that I found very interesting in one of our test sites. We communicated as consistently as H-Work, the H-Work project, but the employee crafted their own name. So I have a little list here on what it turned out to be. So some people said health work, health at work, stress at work, it was called, healthy work, H at work, stress management, working with stress, and the last one I think I really like, somebody called it the H factor, sort of linking to the X factor. So I think we did very well. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. So for the next here we have uh, Caroline, she's a professor of uh, work psychology at the Institute of Work Psychology and Nutrition at the University Management School. And uh, her um, research topic are on the areas of employees' uh, well-being and the new ways of uh, working. And uh, she has uh, a lot of uh, um, published work on uh, this topic. And uh, with Karina Nielsen and uh, Christian, uh, they are leading the activities of uh, 45 evaluation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ooh. Try not to fall over the furniture. It's uh, lovely to be here again um, in this room where it all started. Um, so I concur with my uh, colleagues who have come before me about how wonderful it is to have the full circle and to be here and to share this with you all. Um, as just mentioned, I'm presenting this on behalf of uh, Professor Karina Nielsen um, and also my colleague, uh, Dr. Christian Vasquez. Uh, we're the Sheffield University part of uh, Work Package 5, um, and we uh, focused on the evaluation toolkit. So, um, what I'm going to be talking about today, though, um, I, I was um, very rule bound because originally we talked about three slides each, so I've only done three slides, so I might not have enough um, slides for you today, but uh, I shall. Uh, talk around those, um, there's plenty to say certainly about the evaluation. But what I'm going to be talking about is the general approach that we use within organisations, which was a realist evaluation approach, which is an innovative approach um, to use for evaluation of interventions within organisations. Um, and uh, our PET toolkit or the evaluation toolkit um, is part of that, but I'm going to talk more broadly about all the data that can be used for that, which was collected in other parts of the uh, project as well, um, as mentioned by some of my colleagues. So, uh, realist evaluation then. So, um, probably more familiar with uh, traditional methods of evaluating interventions which mostly, they tend to just focus on the outcome. So uh, measuring well-being or mental health before the intervention took place, and then measuring it again afterwards. And then, you know, seeing, well, what, is there a difference? And did that intervention work in comparison to people who didn't go through the intervention, for instance, in a control room? So, and that's all very well and good, but the problem with that type of approach on its own is it only tells you did that intervention work it doesn't tell you anything about why that intervention worked or why it didn't work perhaps in a particular circumstance uh, so it doesn't tell you anything about the mechanisms that um, would enable that intervention to work or about the context that enabled uh, that helped promote that mechanism from working so what means evaluation does it focuses on the process much more um, rather than just on the outcome. So it focuses in particular on the context. So what is the context um, that's required to bring about change? So for instance, elements of the context you might want to measure would be things around um, support from senior management, for instance, perhaps the policies that are in place within the organisation. Is this a supportive organisation for um, changing mental health? Because you might expect... Uh, within an organisation that's more supportive, that you're going to get more um, change occurring as a result of the interventions. 
And then his uh, approach also focuses on the mechanisms as well. So what are the working mechanisms that have to be triggered in order for that intervention to be successful? So that might include things like uh, to what extent do people use the skills that, that have been uh, trained as part of this intervention? Um, what was the quality of the intervention as well? Um, you know, was, was the process very smooth within the organisation? Did the... Um, did the interventionist create a positive atmosphere so that people could learn? Um, and then also, of course, we focus on the outcomes as well. So this approach really helps us to understand what works for who in different circumstances. So it, it, a key advantage is that it allows us to test models to explain why an intervention worked or why it didn't, you know, why it didn't work in a particular circumstance. So. Um, within, the, uh, within the work that we did and, and the HET, we focused on certain time points in particular. So we focused um, on the sort of middle time points that we're, we're looking at here. But I, I wanted just to explain the range of different data that we can use to try and test uh, the models that we, we would do in realist evaluation, which focus on the context, the mechanisms and the outcome because we've got lots of different data points that we can use for this. So it's a really, I think one of the things we've learned is that it's a really flexible approach, which allows you to pull data from various different sources in order to understand, you know, what enables these interventions to work better uh, and, you know, what things do we need to try and uh, promote within an organisation to help our interventions be more effective. So... This is fairly complex as a model, but I shall go through it. Uh, so what we do have is some quantitative data and also qualitative data. The quantitative data is in the top part um, of this diagram, um, and the qualitative data, which came from interviews, etc., cetera, um, is on the bottom. So uh, if we think about time one, we've got um, measures at baseline in the survey. So what encourages people to participate or engage in intervention uh, activities? So again, it's things around the senior management support. What demands did they have within that organisation? If you've got a very demanding environment, we heard this morning from Alzler as well, uh, if you've got a very demanding environment, then you may be less likely to take part in those interventions. Um, and then also in the needs analysis, as Marek mentioned, uh, you know, we need to uh, ask questions around the sort of policies and procedures within organisations. Uh, you know, what support was there for mental health within that organisation? And then um, at time two, so this was a measure taken immediately after the intervention had taken place. So once people had undertaken training, uh, there was a short survey, which then started to look at the mechanisms. Um, so what are the working mechanisms that might help that intervention to have its impact? So here, this is where we looked at, well, what did people think about the intervention activities? How, you know, did they feel that it was run really well and had high quality um, intervention processes? Um, and also, do they feel that they will use that, um, the skills that they've learned when they go back to the workplace? Then, um, sort of, at, depending on where the intervention was within the uh, programme of activities within the organisation, there, there were um, either one to three time points that we measured um, some other activities as well. Each of these are three months apart. So uh, we were able to evaluate different mechanisms um, three months after the um, uh, intervention had taken place, so have people actually tried to use what they're learning, have they transferred that learning to the workplace? We were also at that time able to me uh, measure certain things about the context as well. Um, so have people had the opportunity to apply what they've learned, has the environment been conducive to them um, applying uh, what skills they've learned, have they had support from their peers and from their line manager in putting those activities to work within the uh, environment. Also, there were some proximal out um, outcomes that we could measure at that point as well, such as had attitudes changed um, to, to mental health. Um, and then later on, uh, at, at uh, time six and seven, so this was six months later, um, and then a, another um, 
four to six months after that, we were able to measure again to look at some of those outcomes. So had mental health change, had performance change, um, and well-being. And there was also some interviews that were conducted around that time as well, where we could get some examples of um, how people have tried to put their activities into practice, um, and also get some uh, information about other um, aspects of the context which may have an impact, such as mergers within organisations, which I think we can talk about a bit later on as well. So here are um, a couple of different examples of these context mechanism outcome um, uh, 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 configurations we call these uh, that could be tested as a result of this so we get much more interesting questions that we can ask from using a realist evaluation approach than we might do if we were just looking at the outcomes so the very first one this is uh, Saranova et al um, part of the project they, um, they um, followed um, a mindfulness intervention within organisations and what they found this is a, quite a typical context mechanism outcome um, model but what they found was that in an environment where there was greater readiness for change within the culture, then this um, led to greater uh, attempts to transfer training to the workplace, which in turn also led to changes in mental health attitudes. And then this uh, second one, this is one that Guzino and colleagues have uh, um, been working on and is um, under review at the moment. But here we see the mechanism is working in a slightly different way. So in this particular example, um, the mechanism is changing the relationship between the context and the outcome. So here, um, what we see is that with this digital team coaching intervention, is when people have attempted to um, implement action plans from that, it compensates for levels of uh, manager support and how that um, how that affects performance. So when people undertake this type of training activity and they implement what they've learned from that training, then they're less reliant on manager support to help them improve uh, team performance. So it, it's really an interesting result, I think, this. So it shows you how we can examine quite interesting relationships with this type of evaluation approach rather than just focusing on the outcome. So that's my presentation, so thank you very much. She's uh, Marita, uh, she's a professor of positive organizational psychology at the Jean University of Spain, and uh, he's the main researcher and director of the One Research Team and the founding partner and the outgoing president of the Spanish Society of Positive psychology. Uh, our work uh, um, with Jose is focused on positive psychology applied uh, to IT organization, resilience, engagement, flow at work, and positive psychology coaching, self-efficacy, and so on. And uh, she leads the activities of uh, Rupi2 uh, Create. Thank you, Marita. Thank you, Julia. Well, uh, first of all, I, I would like to, to put in context my, my talk. Uh, well, we, we were leading the, this work package, number two together with uh, Josefina, Angela, Isabel, and, and Susana, that most of you know. And the idea in this work package was uh, to integrate all the consortium expertise on, on theories and practical uh, tools and so on. And uh, well, in, the, in this first time we say, my God, this is a wonderful <laughs> thing because it was so many knowledge and practices and so on. But it was a very nice uh, work to do in it, also uh, to integrate a question like gender, age, and uh, stereotypes, and stigma, and so on. But uh, uh, what I feel more uh, proud and, and what we learn a lot is uh, about trying to integrate our knowledge about, uh, about uh, this positive uh, psychology framework and also uh, to share uh, what we know, uh, the, the now about positive psychological analysis, 
it was the, the first thing, and I, I would like to, to share with you uh, more things about about that. And uh, well, what kind of PPIs we implemented in Gucci in all the set we, we implement uh, uh, ten interventions in three companies, and I would like to tell you about this experience. And uh, finally, uh, trying to uh, integrate these uh, this ten golden uh, lessons about uh, our learning in this experience. Not only based in this, uh, in this project, this stage one, but also based on other uh, interventions that we are doing in our team in other companies. But uh, the idea was to integrate what we know, what we learn in stage one, and also in other uh, companies' uh, interventions. Well, first, this positive psychology tries to integrate, it's not a novel, a different approach. We try to integrate and, and contribute and, uh, in a way to complement uh, the traditional uh, approach of psychology, uh, like, like Marit was saying, not only the prevention but also promotion of, of health. It was the very famous uh, the definition of positive psychology by the fathers of, of positive psychology. And uh, as, as you see, we try to also enter different kind of levels in, the, uh, in this uh, mental health, that the individual, uh, teams, uh, leaders, groups, and society uh, as a well. whole. Uh, regarding to this positive psychology approach, it's very important we try to uh, develop some and develop this positive psychology, psychology interventions, the PBIs. And the idea is to, to do this kind of educational activities that are to cultivate positive feelings in favor of conditions. And also uh, try to focus on employees, teams, and organizations and improve uh, the mental health and, and well being. And this is the first focus. And of course, if possible, also the productivity and, and uh, performance and, and, and so on. Um, well, I, I am trying to describe, describe all these uh, PBIs because uh, Mari was, uh, was also uh, describing, but uh, they were uh, the, the interventions that we apply in, uh, in Spain. And I, I would like to, to talk about this kind of uh, implementation experience in, in our festival. Well, we publish in the website now <laughs> the, 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 this uh, and all the lessons. Um, for me, um, uh, the, the, the main lesson is that not only in the age work uh, experience uh, project, but also in other companies, is that if, if we want to uh, develop well being and try to do uh, jobs stress free. We can say it's not only uh, important to reduce the uh, stress and burnout and, and so on, but also try to improve and promote mental health in a positive way. This is what I think that was the more important thing. That sometimes it's difficult to communicate to managers and so on, but it was the, the first. And then 